All right, welcome. In this work example, we're taking a look at Newton's law of gravitation as it relates to distant stars and exoplanets. So the very first thing that we do is state Newton's law of gravitation. Newton's law of gravity says that the force of gravity is equal to his universal gravitational constant, capital G, times the mass of one object, times the mass of another object, divided by their separation distance squared. Two masses walk into a bar. And that's the end of the joke. And they're separated by a distance r, and the force of gravity between them is given by this equation. So let's say, so you could write out sort of this law and say where, you know, g is a constant, m is, you know, one mass, lowercase m is another mass, and r is the separation distance. Another way to sort of state this is in terms of the proportionality to say the force of gravity is directly proportional to the product of the masses. The force of gravity is inversely proportional to the separation distance squared and sort of fold both of those ideas together with the constant of proportionality and you get this equation. So you can kind of spell that out in your own words. If you turn in your question paper and it just has the exact same thing that I've written here, it lets me know that you're kind of mindlessly copying it without really thinking through it yourself. So you do need to kind of put that in your own words and write them out on those lines right there. Letting sort of the equations, you know, stand on its own as the answer isn't sufficient to earn these marks. You do need to kind of spell it out. You can write the equation to help you and then say, again, define each thing in it, say where M is mass, R is separation distance, G is a constant, F is the force of gravity. That's fine. Or you can just sort of word it the way I've said it here. Okay. All right. We are studying star system formation, and we know that giant molecular clouds collapse down under gravity. And we also conserve angular momentum. And so by now, the star system is formed. There are several planets around a distant star. Each planet has a circular orbit with a different radius. And so at the end of this lesson, we'll see that, like on the chalkboard, it says, how are the ultimate shape and fate of, of star systems determined? It's really the, the last couple big collisions that occur in the star system that sort of give the final shape of what that star system is gonna look like. And so we're given some data here the radius and the orbital period squared for planets C, E, and G. This is a typical naming convention for exoplanets where they're usually named after the star where the star is like the A object and then the planets are B, C, D, E, F, you know, and so on. Um, for students that are in the lab, you can look back at this poster on the, uh, what direction is this? The Western lab wall and it says Trappist-1. So the Trappist system was discovered a few years ago. And there's a bunch of Earth like planets that are really close into the star. And you can see that they're named Trappist 1, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And they have periods between 1.5 days and 20 days. So all closer into the, the star than even Mercury and our star system. And so this is just, you know, some distant exoplanet, like it says. And we got some, um, or distant exoplanets, a distant star. What we're going to do with this data is look at this is. Kepler's third law of planetary motion and show that the constant K is given by this using some ideas about circular motion and finally calculate the mass of the star. So we can determine how massive a star is based on the orbital data of the planets that are going around it. And that's what we're gonna do here. All right, so part B here says, um, a distant star is orbited by several planets. Each planet has a circular orbit with different radius. Each planet orbits at constant speed. Explain whether the planets are in equilibrium. If there is evidence of acceleration, then it's not in equilibrium. And so this was the key idea that we wanna sort of really make sure that is, is well known. There is a force that is balanced here Centripetal force describes the force that pushes the planets towards the center of the circle that they are you know, sweeping out as they orbit. And that is the net force. And so if there is a net force, then the object is not in equilibrium, right? It's gonna accelerate in the direction of the net force. Gravity is just the thing that is providing that center seeking or that centripetal force. And so the answer to this is no. The planets, are not in equilibrium because 
they are accelerating. And I'm going to put in parentheses here, changing direction. It, it's not um, a contradiction to say that constant speed and you know something can have constant speed and still be accelerating. Why? Because it's moving in a circle. So acceleration is a vector. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So if you're changing your velocity, you're accelerating. Speed and velocity are two slightly different things in physics. Speed just tells us like how fast we're going, but velocity tells us a direction also. There's a vector in nature to this. And so we were calculating like if we're going this way at some time with velocity v, and then sometime later we're going this way, you know, with velocity v, that's a change in direction. Circular motion, like the very nature of a circle, is constantly changing direction. And therefore, acceleration, because you are changing your velocity if you're changing your direction, going from this direction to that direction to that direction, even if the magnitude of this velocity, the speed stays the same, you're accelerating by virtue of the fact you're changing direction and therefore no equilibrium. Just because there is a centripetal force, a center seeking force, and we balance that against gravity, like we can balance those forces and you might think, oh, well, that's kind of like equilibrium. No, the net force is gravity. Gravity is the net force acting on it, and it just is acting in that direction. Okay. So that, that's a stable orbit, right? They're all going at different sort of uh, radii there, and so they're, they're not going to crash into each other. They're nice, happy, stable orbits because centripetal force is balanced against gravity. And you'll see that it's showing what the value of K is here. So we got some orbital data there, and we're going to determine what this constant k is. They just sort of give you the relationship here on this page, and they ask you to, to show it sort of right here. Show that k should be these numbers, gm over 4 pi squared. All right, so or do this again in short order here. The ideas that are right at the heart of circular motion are centripetal force, which in general is mv squared over r. So the setup there is you've got some central mass, and you've got an object in orbit around it. So this would be like our protostar, and we have this accretion disk that we know is forming all these different sort of planets. And so we have three planets at three different radii, and they're lowercase m. They're the things doing the orbiting. As we mentioned a moment ago, they have this tangential velocity v, right? They're all going at some tangential speed v, and they're all a different radius r away from the central mass. So the force that pushes them towards the center of the circle that keeps them moving in a circle is equal to this, their mass times their tangential velocity squared divided by R, the radius. We know it's given by gravity or it's provided by gravity. And a moment ago, we said that Newton's law of universal gravitation is equal to this. So we set those things equal to each other as we've done many times before. We cancel out lowercase m, we cancel out R in the denominator leaving sort of one factor behind. And we get this expression for orbital velocity. The orbital velocity squared is gm over r. And so the velocity is root gm over r. Yesterday, we were looking at how when things sort of collapse in, there's a certain speed to keep them at a certain sort of radius where centripetal force balances against gravity. And in the accretion disk, you've got that fluid friction where the things that are closer in right, are going faster. And so they sort of pull along the, the parts of the disk that are a little bit further out and speed them up. And likewise, the parts that are in get sort of dragged down and they get slowed down by the slower moving further away parts of the accretion disk. All right, so we've got this. Remember that for circular motion, the distance around a circle is the circumference 2 pi r. And so we can make a substitution for velocity like this. Now, what we would do sort of mathematically with this one is just sort of square everything sort of back to here, right? Because we don't want to work underneath the radical. And so we can make a substitution like this in, you know, for v here sort of to this part of the equation. So that's going to look like 2 pi r over t quantity squared, that's v squared, equal to gm over r. And then start, you know, squaring everything. So two squared is four, pi squared is pi squared, r squared over t squared equal to gm over r. And we're trying to get r cubed all by itself. And so when we multiply both sides by r, 
there's our R cubed, right? And then we kind of want to isolate that. So just take care to not lose track of anything. There's our R cubed. And so we'll multiply this side by the convenient factor T squared over four pi squared. T squared divided by T squared is one. Four pi squared divided by four pi squared is one. One times R cubed is just R cubed. I'll make a capital to resemble this. And on this side, I'm left with um, G M over four pi squared times T squared. So it resembles this. So T squared all by itself, R cubed right here. If you were to plot a graph for our planets and our solar system of the radius of all of our planets cubed against their orbital period squared, you'd find that they all fall into a straight line and the slope of that line would be equal to this. This is like Y equals MX, the familiar equation of a line where if we plot this quantity against this quantity, sure enough, there's a relationship between these things in nature. That's what Kepler realized five centuries ago, but he never knew the value of his constant. He solved everything in terms of proportion, you know, comparing it. Newton never even knew the value of his own constant, but was able to do some work you know, with Kepler. As Newton famously said, he stood on the shoulders of giants like Galilee and like Kepler. So here we've shown that K is equal to this, GM over four pi squared, exactly what we wanted to do to earn those three marks right there, right? So show that the constant K is equal to GM over four pi squared. And that's exactly what we've got here, right? So we have this relationship of R cubed equals some constant K times T squared. And now we know what that constant actually is. It's Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the central object, right? The thing being orbited divided by four pi squared. The last part of this is to calculate what the actual mass of the star is using some data from that um, table. So you can use sort of whichever planet you like there. Go back up to the data to, to finish this calculation. Remembering that this is true, R cubed equals GM over four pi squared times T squared. All right, so a moment ago, we saw that um, R cubed equals four pi squared, or did I mess that up? Yeah. So it's uh, GM over four pi squared, right? Get a spot of any. All right, so if we're solving for the mass, let's go ahead and isolate that variable on this side of the equation. And so we're going to um, take, divide each side by t squared and multiply both sides by 4 pi squared. We also got to divide by a g, right? So on the, the right side over here, we're going to have r cubed times 4 pi squared divided by t squared g. All that's equal to the mass of the star, right? And that's just sort of isolating mass on this side, dividing each side by t squared. So it's in the denominator on this side, multiplying both sides by four pi squared to cancel it over here. So it's in the numerator on this side, and then dividing both sides by g. Now we do have to square one of these quantities, but this one is already squared for us, right? So we can just substitute that in the corresponding t squared into the denominator here. So I'm going to make my substitutions for this. I guess I'll just do it right down here. And so I'll use the C planet, 9.6 by 10 to the 10, and then the units there are meters. We're going to get kilograms of mass because everything is in the preferred sort of SI units. And so I'm going to drop the units to tidy up the calculation. Times 4 pi squared over 2.5 by 10 to the 11. And remember, I don't need to square that. It's already squared, right? So, so that is T squared times 6.67 by 10 to the negative 11 is the value of G in SI unit. Here's where you gotta make sure that you can 
push the buttons correctly. I'll do it on the screen for the benefit of anybody following along at home. Nine point six times ten to the ten. But we got to cube that times four times pi times pi again, right? Pi squared. So that's my numerator dividing now by the p squared, which is two point five by ten raised to the 11. Note how I use grouping symbols there because I want to divide by that entire quantity, right? I don't want to divide by 2.5 and then multiply by 10 to the 11 by 100 billion. I want to divide by 250 billion, right? So when I hit equals, it does the division, okay? It was showing me the value that I had in parentheses previously. Divided by a really small number. And again, you got to type this using grouping symbols, 6.67 times 10 raised to the negative 11. When I close the parentheses, I can see the value I want to divide by. When I hit equals, it will do the division, and that's the quotient there. So 2.09 by 10 to the 33, which we would round to probably 2.1 by 10 to the 33. So the final answer here is we have a star orbited by a couple of planets at different radii. And we get a final answer of Two point one times ten to the thirty-three kilograms. Our own sun is about ten to the thirty kilograms, and so this is something that's about a thousand times more massive than our own sun. And this has been another worth example with Dr. Schleiss. We'll see you next.